Hey everyone, welcome to another video. Today we're going to be working through uh, an AP Calc VC free response question. I genuinely like these questions because I think they're really cool and integrate a lot of information from across different parts of differential and integral calculus. Um, and they're just fun to do it uh, when you remove the, the pressure of writing them for an exam, writing an exam, right? So let's go ahead and talk about this now. So just for your reference, by the way, this is, a 2000, this is from the 2018 AP Calc PC exam. It's question three, uh, it's on the non-calculated portion. So I will post a link to where I found these. They're just on College Board's website. So you're welcome to check those out at your leisure as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at this. So we're given the graph of this function g over here, and we're told that g of x is a continuous function, which is the derivative of some other function f of x. Right? We don't actually doesn't actually tell us anything about f of x, but we're just told that g of x is the first derivative of f of x, right? So that's given to us. We're also told that g of x is piecewise linear for this interval here from negative 5 to, to 3, uh, not including 3, and that it takes on the, this quadratic, which is 2 times, so this is this quadratic here, it takes on a quadratic from 3 to, um, from 3 to 6. Great, so now we're being asked a couple of questions. So firstly, given that f of one is three, what is the value of f of negative five? Well, once again, remember we're being asked about the function f of x about which we don't actually know anything, right? We only know that the derivative is g of x and we were told this will be this information about g of x, right? So how do we apply the information about the derivative to tell us information about the original function? Well, that's where we use an integral, right? So we're going to have to make use of an integral here. So we've got what we're looking for, which is f of negative 5, right? And what we know is that f of 1 is 3, so we'll, we'll start at f of 1. And then we'll tag on this integral from 1 to 5 of g of x, which is um, f prime of x, or the derivative dx, right? And remember, we start at 1. And then this integral here represents the net change from 1 to negative 5. Right? So that's what that integral does for us. However, notice that, oh, that should be a negative 5. My apologies. However, notice that my lower bound in this case is actually greater than my upper bound. That can be a little bit uh, annoying to deal with at times. So what I'm going to do right off the bat is I'm going to switch this sign. I'm going to switch these signs. Right? I'm going to switch these bounds. Excuse me. I'm going to switch these bounds and then add on a negative sign there. Okay, which is perfectly legal. So we have um, we have f of one, which we know is three, right? And then we're going to tag on a negative sign times the integral, not from one to negative five anymore, but the integral from negative five to one, right, of g of x dx. Again, the reason for that is just because I don't like dealing with the bounds like this. It's much easier to work with when they're like this. Okay. Let's go ahead and take that integral now. So if we come up here, let's see what we can do. So you'll notice though that we're not actually told what g of x takes on from negative five to, to three, right? Or which the this interval here which we're interested in. Right? We're only told that it's piecewise linear. So therefore we can't actually use anti-differentiation to evaluate this integral. We're going to need to use something different. As it turns out, since that we're since we're told that this is linear, we can actually go ahead and use signed areas. Right? Signed areas. Yeah. And by signed areas, what I mean is we just come up to the graph over here and we just literally use this, this shape right here to find the area under that curve um, on the given interval. Right? So let's go ahead and do that. Right? So we're going to start at minus 5. We're going to find the area under this curve all the way from minus 5 up till 1. Okay, so we're going to find all that area. Right? So let's break this up into a couple of shapes. Right? So we have, um, if we break this up like this, we have, oops, yeah. So we have a triangle and a, a square here. Right? If we break it up like that. And we have, uh, on this side, another triangle. Okay. So if we take the area of all those pieces, 
add them together, we'll get our final answer. Okay. So for the square here, oops, so for this square here, yeah, my area is going to be um, just the width times the height. This is a four by, uh, sorry, a three by three square because you know we go three units. So the area is just going to be three times three, which is nine. Okay. This triangle here, we need. We're going to use the formula one half base times height. The base is one. As you can see, it goes from negative one to negative two. The height is also three, same as square there. So it's just going to be one half, one, three, which comes out to one point five, or three halves. Sweet. Next thing we want to do is find the area of this triangle here, right? So we're once again going to use one half base times height. So we'll have one half. Our base this time is also one. And our height this time is going to be 2, right? So height is going to be 2. And this 2 and that 2 are actually just going to cancel out. So we're just left with an area of 1. Okay. Now you might be wondering why I colored all these areas differently. And that's one. That's, that brings me to one aspect of the whole concept of signed areas that we need to talk about. right? And that is that when you have area below the x-axis, or area above the x-axis, there's a different there's a difference in how we treat those, right? So area below the x-axis, we always assign a net negative sign to, right? We always assign a negative sign to any areas below the x-axis. Likewise, anything above the x-axis, we assign a positive sign to, right? So that's why I've colored these things differently, because any areas below the x-axis, we want to treat as negative. Anything above, we treat as positive. So yeah, give, bearing that in mind, let's sum all these together and get our final answer for this integral. Okay, so if we do that, we will have three minus negative nine, right? We'll have negative nine minus 1.5 from this guy up here, and then plus one. And now we just need to add these all up and we'll have our final answer. So minus 1.5 plus 1 is just minus 0.5. Nine, negative 9 minus uh, negative point, negative 9 minus 0 0.5 is just going to be negative 9.5. And now bear in mind, so we, all, we have this other negative sign out here. So we'll really need to be, um, so we're really going to be adding. So if all of this comes out to negative 9.5, since I have this extra minus sign out here, I'm really adding 9.5 instead of subtracting. So 3 plus 9.5, uh, this is going to give me 12.5 as my final answer. Which, if you want to be picky about using fractions, is just 25 halves. Okay? And there's your final answer. Wonderful. So that's part A. Let's talk about part B now. Part B, we're now being asked to evaluate the integral from 1 to 6 of g of x dx. Very similar to what we did up here. Okay, So we're going to we want to find the integral from 1 to 6 of g of x dx. So let's go up there, go back up and see what exactly g of x is for that interval. Now there's something interesting that happens here. We're starting at 1, right? We start at 1 and we end at 6. Notice that between on this interval, my function actually switches what value it takes, right? So from negative five to three, it's this piecewise linear thing, but from three to six, it's this quadratic here. So it's switching what value it takes on. So we need to take that into account in our integral, right? So we know that this, this function switches what value it is at three. So we're gonna need to break our function, our integral up into two separate integrals. Um, as follows. So this is going to be equal to the integral from 1 to 3 of g of x dx plus the integral from 3 to 6 of g of x dx. Okay? Hope that makes sense. Yeah? So, and again, this piece right here is, um, is in that linear area. Right? This piece right here is in that linear area, so we can evaluate this guy using a signed area. 
Whereas with this guy, we actually are told what the function is, so we can just use the regular anti-differentiation method. Or anti-differentiation plus fundamental theorem of calculus part two, if we want to be a little more picky. Okay, so that's that. So let's go ahead and um, let's go ahead and do this guy first. Now. So if we come back over here, uh, I'm going to erase what we've got here just so we have some more space. Okay, just to clean things up a bit. So we're interested in the area from one to three, right? So we're interested in this area right here. That's just a two by two square. Right? So the area is just going to be 2 times 2, which is just going to be 4. So that's our answer for that integral. Um, so yeah, that's basically what that's going to be. So we have 4. And then on this side, for that piece, we're going to have the integral from 3 to 6 of 2 times, what is that? It's, um, yeah, x minus 4 squared. dx and this right here will require a little bit more work okay so there's a couple of different ways so there's a couple of different ways in which you might approach this integral so you could um, you could foil it out and anti-differentiate each piece or you could use a u substitution and and uh, go from there both are fairly straightforward but since the foiling is just a little bit more algebra we're going to go with uh, u substitution in this video, but again, just know that both methods are equally correct. So let's do a u sub here. So we're gonna pick u equals x minus four. Pretty nice u sub there. So we're gonna get du equals just dx, because the derivative of x is just one. And, and now at this point, I actually have another choice here. I can choose either to keep my bounds in terms of x, in which case I will have to plug back in for x when I finish taking my uh, anti when I finish evaluating my antiderivative, or I can switch my bounds to the u world right away, and then I don't need to plug back in. I'm going to switch my bounds over to the u world, and that way I don't have to plug back in for x when I'm done uh, doing my anti-differentiation. Right? So let's go ahead and do that. So when x is equal to 3, this gives me that u equals, uh, is going to be 3 minus 4, which is minus 1. Likewise, when x is equal to 6, that tells me that u is going to be uh, 6 minus 4, which is just going to be a plus 2. And now I can use these as my new bounds of integration. Okay, Let's come down here and put this all together. Right? So now I'm going to have that 4 still carries over for the previous part. Right? So then we're going to have the integral not from 3 to 6 anymore, but from minus 1 to 2 of um, 2 times u squared du. That's a pretty nice one to actually evaluate. So uh, what we're going to end up with is we'll have 4 plus, we're just going to have a reverse power rule there. So that's going to be 2 thirds u cubed evaluated from negative 1 to 2. Now, if you were, if you did not switch your bounds over to the u world, right, if you did not do that, you would need to plug back in for x now, and then use your original bounds to evaluate. Either process will give you the exact same answer, but it will be a slightly different path, right? But this is what we've chosen, so we can just go ahead and evaluate these right now, right, since we already switched our bounds over, okay? So this piece right now, we look at that separately is going to come out to if we plug in the 2 that will be uh, 2 cubed which is 8 uh, 8 times 2 is 16 so we have 16 over 3 minus um, if we plug in negative 1 that's just going to be negative 2 thirds yeah cool so now that we've got that, we just uh, add these two together because the negative signs cancel. So we're going to get um, 18 thirds, which is just going to come out to 6. So the final thing we have right here is just going to be 4 plus 6, which gives us 10. So our final answer to this, this whole integral 
is just 10. Lovely. That was a really cool question. All right, now let's look at part C. So part C uh, is asking us for this interval, right, for, our, our, for the interval of this graph, we're being asked um, where this function f of x is both increasing and concave up. What do those words increasing and concave up mean to us in terms of, of calculus? Well, increasing, right, that's where f prime of x is greater than zero, right? Concave up, likewise, is where f double prime of x is greater than zero. But once again, again, we run into the same caveat where we don't actually know anything about f of x, right? What do we know stuff about, though? Well, we do know stuff about g of x, right? So how did these, these two things come into play in terms of g of x? Well, g of x is for f prime of x. g of x is equal to f prime of x. So basically, when we say f prime of x is greater than 0, we're really looking for where g of x is positive, right? We're looking for where g of x is greater than 0. Likewise, when we look for where f double prime of x is greater than 0, we're looking for where g prime is greater than 0. Okay? All right, so now let's come up here to the graph and uh, see what we can make of it. Okay? So I'm going to just quickly erase this guy to give us some more space. Um, but let's see what we can make of this. So we're looking for places which satisfy these two criteria, right? So where g prime of x is greater, where g of x is greater than 0 and g prime of x is greater than 0. We can eliminate some things right off the bat, right? So we can eliminate this entire piece over here. Right? This is since g of x is less than 0 here, so that this doesn't work. We can also eliminate this piece over here, right? Since g prime of x is less than 0 there, right? Because if you look at it, the g of x is decreasing there, so g prime of x is less than 0. We can also eliminate this part. Right? We can also eliminate this line here, this one line here, because over there, g prime of x, g of sorry, g of x is greater than zero, but g prime of x is equal to zero. So that does not um, that doesn't work for us here. Right? So we can eliminate all these we can eliminate all three of these regions. So we can eliminate all three of these regions, and now what we're left with is just these two pieces here. So we have this line here. And we have this other piece over here. Okay. What are the x values? Well, uh, if we clear away some of this rubble, um, let's make that. If we clear away some of this, um, this rubble here, we'll see that that interval is going to be from zero to one. Right. We're going from zero to one, and from four to six. Those are our point. That's going to be our interval, right? So we can say, we can come down here and say, all right. So if we we can come down here and say, um, the intervals are going to be from zero to one, and from four to six. But they ask us to explain why. So let's go ahead and explain. So we can say that on these intervals, right? g of x is greater than 0. And remember, g, prime of x, g of x represents f prime of x, right? And g of x is increasing, which implies, this thing right here implies that g prime of x is greater than 0. Which also impl which doubly implies that f double prime of x is greater than zero. Hence, right? Hence, f of x is increasing. Sorry, my handwriting there was really terrible. Is increasing and concave up. On these intervals. Sweet. So that's part C. 
Last but not least, we will work on part D. And that one right here tells us we want to find the x-coordinate of each point of inflection on the graph of f. Right? So once again, I'm going to go ahead and erase all this just to, just to make things a little bit easier for us. Okay? So we're being asked for, to find the point x-coordinate for each point of inflection. Right? Points of inflection, remember, are places where f double prime of x switches signs. Right? Switches signs from positive to negative or negative to positive. Right? But since we're not talking about f double prime of x, we only know about g of x, so we're looking for where g prime of x switches signs. Okay. So to help me out with this, I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna make a little chart here, and I'm gonna track exactly what g prime of x is doing um, at every given interval here. Right, so let's, so that place looks interesting. So let's make a line there. Okay, so on this interval from over here, g prime is just zero, right? From from negative two to minus one, it's increase, it's positive, right? Because g of x is increasing. On this interval here, from negative one to zero, it's again zero. Over here, once again, we're increasing. Over here, on this interval here, we're, we're once again, we're zero. And now, now here, now here, we're decreasing. And now everywhere else, we're increasing, right? So zero, increasing, zero, increasing, zero, decreasing, increasing. So out of these, which of these satisfies our criteria for being where g prime of x switches signs. Well, that's going to be down here, right? Because all of these, like switching from 0 to uh, something doesn't really count. So we want to find where it switches from positive to negative or negative to positive. That's the only place where that happens. So our answer is going to be x equals 4, right? So let's come down here and uh, tell them that. So it's going to be x equals 4. And why is because um, g prime of x, which is the same thing as f double prime of x, switches signs from uh, switches signs from negative to positive, from negative to positive at x equals 4. Wonderful. And yeah, that brings us to the end of this problem. Um, I will check the answer key before I post this just to make sure I've got everything right. But I think I, I have everything, everything down here. And yeah, that's basically what your average AP Calculus BC FRQ is like. So I hope you guys had fun in this video. So please do let me know if you'd like to see more of this from, from my channel. They're generally kind of fun to do. And uh, yeah, it'd be great to make more of these. If you found this video helpful, please do like, share, subscribe, leave a comment and check out some other videos. See you next time!